The hook we're tying our Tongariro bomb on today is a Hanuk Competition Jig Trophy size 10. We're going to be securing this 4.6mm black tungsten bead, it's a slotted bead, with some 015 lead wire. Let's talk a moment about the, um, the slotted tungsten bead and how it's designed to sit on this hook correctly. If I push this forward, notice how it's going to stop at that coat hanger where the bend is at the front of the jig. If we rotate that bead around, it won't stop. It'll go all the way if it's in the correct position. If we rotate it the other way, it'll act like a standard countersunk bead and won't go all the way to the eye. So twist it until it does go all the way to the eye. You can see that it's quite loose and jigging around. So let's introduce some lead wire to anchor that in place. I'm going to use my trusty CNF hackle pliers. These things are indispensable for gripping slippery stuff like this this lead wire so that there's not much waste. So let's introduce that to the rear of the hook. It's not to add weight, it's just to um, center and position that bead and lock it in place. So we need enough wraps that a bit of it's going to be protruding out of the bead once we shove that into the slotted bead. So I'm aiming for about six or seven turns in this case. Just eyeball it, you can put the bead up against um, the lead wraps to see if you're close and then just aim for consistency. So we'll do one more wrap for good measure and just helicopter that off so that you get a clean break instead of wrecking your scissors. Now, I just pinched that off, um, put a little bit too much pressure on the, um, the hackle pliers. What we want to do anyhow is just burnish that last wrap down. So I'm holding it in position with my finger so that it doesn't keep rotating around the hook. And just, there we go, it's in place. Now we're going to push it forward and I'll show you what's going on. So if we come up against that bead, you can see it's barely going to fit into that slot. So we're going to aid things. I would normally use my debarbing pliers, but I don't have them handy. So I've got my fishing forceps. They'll do the job. What we're going to do is just flatten that just a tiny amount. We don't want to fatigue it. So we'll just flatten it a minimal amount. And so you can see what's going on now. It's just flatten that enough that it will slide up into that bead all the way. That's what we want. And see how it's a little bit proud? Now we're going to build up a thread dam to lock that all in place and keep it there. We're using a brown 3 bar o MFC thread, but any thread will do. I would recommend a slightly heavier thread so that we can do this process more quickly. Attach the thread just behind the lead wraps, building a smooth foundation. You don't want to make this too short because if we build a really short ramp, we're not going to have a nice taper. And the other thing is, if it's a really aggressive ramp, the thread will have a propensity to slide down. So just coming back towards, doing a little build up against there, back halfway. And just building that taper up gradually, you can spin your thread if you want to, so that you have less build up, but this is all going to be hidden, and we just want to keep it relatively smooth before we come up onto the lid wraps and really secure everything. And now coming to the rear, I'm going to flatten my thread to the tail tie-in point just by giving it a spin in a counterclockwise direction. For our tailing material, we're using this sexy, fiery ginger CDL. It's a saddle feather from Whiting Farms. Preen the feather barbs out at 90 degrees. We want to grab a generous dozen or so barbs, keep them aligned. Grab onto those, strip them off the feather, keeping them aligned. And we're going to cut these little curly ends off. They'll make the barbs misalign if we don't cut them off and we're aiming for about a generous half a half a shank length or a bit longer than half a shank length I'm positioning my thumb where that measurement is coming from doing one loose wrap over the top letting the thread torque carry that tail onto the top of the hook 
and keeping it on top of the hook. We don't want to roll our tail. The way we do that is we come up and over with some tension and our maximum tension is going to be pulling up. So now I'm giving it maximum tension. That keeps everything on top of the hook until we get to the position. I like going into the bend a little bit. So into the bend and then cutting forward so that there's no build up there. You're going to be able to do this more easily. I've got a lens in the way, but doing a flush cut just at the back of that bead. We're going to put a dab of brushable super glue just to keep it, all the work in place. It's coming up and over, up and over, keeping everything on top of the hook. And with those thread wraps cutting into that super glue, it makes for an ultra durable body. And just park our thread at the front, flatten it out. For the body, we're using a brassy sized ultra wire. It's a UTC copper brown. Give yourself a generous length of this, and we're just going to shove that up into the slot of the tungsten bead, come up over once traveling forward twice, three times, bending that up, keeping the tension on the thread. We're not letting go of the tension, come behind. And one more security wrap before we park our bobbin. I'm going to add another dab of super glue and that's going to help keep everything secure and in place. Maximum tension up and over, trying to keep things at 90 degrees. Bearing in mind I've got a lens in the way here, so this will be a lot quicker for you. But keeping constant tension on there, I try and pick it up with my thumb when I trade grips and come up and over. If you have a little bit of a gap, it's not, sorry for bumping the lens there, it's not the end of the world. Um, Depending on the thread color that you've used, you can hide a multitude of sins. Um, but it is it is nice to try and keep these touching turns. And this is where a good smooth thread foundation makes a huge difference. So you want to keep things slim. We could have used a larger diameter wire. That would have made the coverage um, a lot quicker. But we're trying to keep things really slim for our bomb so that it gets down. And that's why I've used Brassy. So it's a trade-off of you know, getting a slower coverage or getting a quick coverage but ending up with more mass that doesn't sink as quickly. So coming forward, touching turns. Now we're going to cut forward at an angle and rib the body with the same wire. Just open spirals, aiming for about five. There's a third turn, fourth turn, and fifth turn. Now we just want to cut across that doing two or three security turns under maximum tension, traveling forward, one in front. I'm going to grab my trusty hackle pliers again. It's a lot easier to do this in front of the camera. Normally I just worry it off with my hands, but just worry that by helicoptering it until it breaks. For our dubbing, we're using an SLF synthetic dubbing. And the shade that we're using today is a Sculpin Olive. Like any dubbing, keep it sparse, especially in this instance. All we're doing is we're trying to um, fill that little gap behind the bead and give it a more natural transition. We certainly don't want a real scruffy build up here. So grabbing a small pinch, holding it up against the thread, your finger, bringing your thumb across and twisting it in a clockwise uh, direction. Just sparse amounts until you've got a short noodle. You can always add dubbing. Coming up and over, 
one turn to right up against the bead and now coming back again and I want my last wrap to actually cut through that dubbing. Well, what's, what that's going to do is keep it slim and secure and then in front of the bead. We can clean this up a little bit. At this point, I'm going to add another dab of super glue over the body. That's just going to darken it up a little bit and give it more longevity and durability. You can leave it at that as a bomb but to make it pretty we're going to add some UV resin at the end. Now I'm just going to put a little bit of that super glue onto the thread right where it meets the the body and go into a three turn web finish. So pick that up, come up and over before it dries and sets on us, two and three, pull that up, cinch that down by giving it a good pull back towards the tail, bring in our cutter and keeping the thread taut, we're just going to feed that in and cut that off. Now we could leave this fly the way it is, call it a job done and fish it as is, but we are going to add a hot spot. I've got some Glow Bright number four, which is a fluoro orange, loaded in a bobbin, ready to go to add a hot spot to either an existing fly or a fly we've just tied like this one in this instance. Using our trusty CNF hackle pliers again, we're gripping the most minuscule amount um, of this glow bright so that we don't waste much of it. We're just going to feed that up behind the bead and take one full revolution of our glow bright, a second one for good measure behind that first turn, and park the bobbin. Now we're going to come in here with our scissors and hold onto that tag whilst we trim it off. Now we come up and over, do one more turn, just for security. We're going to come in with our whip finisher, pick that up, and now it's important that we do this at 90 degrees. We don't, we, we want to create a hot spot, but we don't want an enormous hot spot. So just do a three turn whip finish. I'm going to come back onto it with a fourth one, just releasing that nice and smoothly, pulling that up nice and smoothly. This stuff, because it's a multi-stranded filament, you can see how that's sort of separated there because I've flattened it. it it's actually quite frail and fragile. And I'm just going to pull that nice and snug, move that around and make sure that I position it and it's snug with my thumbnail, quite happy with that. Reach in there and snip that tag off. First things first, we're going to secure that with some UV flow. This stuff is really thin and gets into the thread wraps nicely, so you want to put a generous amount on there. Use your bodkin to just make sure that you get coverage all the way around. And now this step isn't essential, but it makes for a better looking fly. We're just going to use some UV thin. Put a generous amount on there, not too much. And again, using our bodkin, we're just going to position that. Meanwhile, the flow is getting soaked into those wraps nicely. It's really sinking in. Now we're just going to hit that with our UV torch. And there we have it, a Tongariro bomb ready for deployment. In this extreme close-up, if we look at the hotspot, you can see what a fantastic job the UV flow by Loon does of sealing those wraps. It's really penetrated the glow bright and secured it in place. But the major advantage and the thing that I like most about it, when I open my box of flies, they don't smell like a nail salon, which is the case when you use varnish or nail polish. Even once it's dried and cured a week later, they still have that smell about them. You don't get that with Loon UV flow.
I hope you've enjoyed it. See you on the water.